Welcome to the Berkshires Gone By, history and folklore about the westernmost and most beautiful county in Massachusetts. I'm your host, Brooke. Sometime around 1742, a little baby girl was born, a little black girl whose lot in life was to grow up a slave. Her parents were both stolen from Africa and sold in America. Her name was Bet. But this show is called The Berkshires Gone By. So why am I talking about slavery? Because New England didn't start as the bastion of freedom it would one day become. In the early days of the colonies, there were no laws against it. So, of course, people did it. In fact, Massachusetts was the center of the slave trade in the 17th and 18th centuries. It was the first colony to have slavery in the New World. New England had many white people that were forced to work as indentured servants, either as a way to pay back boat captains for their passage to the New World, or after being kidnapped from the Old World and brought to the New One by force. But most of those people would eventually be freed after their contracts ran out. Those contracts usually lasted about five years, if rules were followed. But that wasn't the norm for people born black. Bet was born in Claverack, New York, on a farm owned by Pieter Hodgeboom. When Bet was still very small, Pieter's daughter Hannah married a man named John Ashley and moved to live with her husband in Sheffield, Massachusetts. A little later on, Bet and another girl, who may have been her little sister, named Lizzie, were either given or perhaps sold to the newlyweds as house servants. The house was a hotbed of revolutionary meetings among the leaders of the town. The Sheffield Declaration was penned in the study on the second floor in 1773, which was a petition against British rule and a demand for individual rights. Ironic, really, considering the slaves that lived under its roof. While still quite young, she was allowed to marry, which in no way granted her any sort of freedom, and she gave birth to a daughter they'd name Little Bet. Her husband is said to have died far too soon while fighting in the Revolutionary War. Bet and her sister were never taught to read or write. John Ashley, who later became a colonel, was a landowner, a lawyer, a shrewd businessman, and a leader of the community, seemed a level-headed sort of fellow, but it would appear that he married his opposite in terms of personality, because his wife Hannah was known to have a very short temper. I found two tales of her rages. One says, the young woman came to the Ashley home, looking for the advice of Mr. Ashley. But when Mrs. Hannah Ashley discovered that the trouble the girl was looking for advice about was that she'd become pregnant by her boss's son and that they were unmarried, Hannah became outraged and came at the young woman. It said that Bet had to force herself between them to get Hannah to give up the fight and that Bet waited outside with the young lady until Hannah's husband came home. Another story is that Lizzie and Bet were in the kitchen working when they became hungry. They mixed together some simple wheat cakes, but when Hannah came in and saw what they'd done, she accused them of stealing food. She grabbed an ash shovel from the fireplace and drew it above her head with Lizzie in her sights. But before she could swing it down, Bet leapt in front of Lizzie and took the blow of the shovel across her arm. It injured her quite badly and took a long time to heal. Even after it had, the scar was very noticeable. As a jab to her owner, she's quoted as saying, Madam never again laid her hand on Lizzie, and added, I had a bad arm all winter, but Madam had the worst of it. I never covered the wound, and when people said to me, Before Madam, Betty, what ails your arm? I only answered, Ask Mrs., which was the slave, and which was the real Mrs., the abolitionist movement had already begun in Massachusetts and set the stage for what would come by putting the right people in the right places, but it was Bet who hatched the plan. There are two different tales of how she heard the newly ratified Massachusetts Constitution read aloud. One story says that she was in town running errands for the household when she came across a gathering. A man was standing before the crowd and reading from the document for all to hear. Another possibility is that Bet was going around her normal duties in the house while a gathering of leaders of the community was taking place. It was a common occurrence in the Ashley home, but that it was there that she heard the document read. What's known for sure is that she couldn't read. What's known for sure is that what she heard sparked an idea that would change the path of lives of slaves forever. She listened as the words, All men are born free and equal, and have certain natural, essential, and unalienable rights, among which may be reckoned the right of enjoying and defending 
their lives and liberties, that of acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, in fine, that of seeking and obtaining their safety and happiness. Beth's heart must have fluttered when the notion popped into her mind, and then followed by the possibility of someone that could help her. It must have been thrilling. As soon as she could get away, Bet fled the Ashley house, and came a few towns north to Stockbridge, to the home of an attorney and well-known former slave owner who had turned abolitionist, Theodore Sedgwick. I heard that paper read yesterday that says, all men are created equal, and that every man has the right to freedom. I'm not a dumb critter. Won't the law give me my freedom? She argued. Theodore Sedgwick accepted her case, and asked a friend, tapping Reeve, the founder of the very first law school in the colonies, for assistance. Brom, another slave owned by the Ashleys, also joined the suit. It was August of 1781, when in Great Barrington, the County Court of Common Pleas heard their case. The case was made that the new constitution of the state effectively made slavery illegal. They pointed to the lines that read, All men are born free and equal. The court didn't take long to decide on the matter. Only one day. Bet and Brom became the first people to win their freedom in the eyes of Massachusetts law. It was a personal victory for Mr. Sedgwick as well. He'd helped to undertake a huge victory in the fight for the abolition of slavery. It was decided that Bet and Brom were never and should not have ever been treated as though they were property, and the Ashleys were ordered to pay the two back wages for their years of service. Bet received 30 shillings. The Ashleys did try to mount an appeal, but the court wouldn't have any of it. Mr. Ashley asked Bet to return to their home and work for him, this time for pay. But Bet wasn't interested. She and the Sedgwicks had become close during their time working together, and she was offered a position in their household, so she went to work for them. This is when Bet changed her name to Elizabeth Freeman. Because of their case, Massachusetts would also become the first state to abolish the practice of slavery and the slave trade on March 26th of 1788. Elizabeth attended to the Sedgwicks as senior governess, and her skills at nursing the ill became well known. Her skill at taking charge, keeping a level head, and her clever mind came into play again and again to benefit the family. She looked after the Sedgwick children, and they dubbed her with the affectionate name Mom Bet, and even at times, simply, Mother. Catherine was one of these children. Catherine Sedgwick would grow up to be a respected author, and it was she who would write the life story of Elizabeth Freeman. The wife of Thomas Sedgwick was a woman named Pamela Dwight. Despite suffering ill health for most of her life, which may have been in reality a mental disorder such as bipolar disorder or depression, she gave birth to ten children. Because of their mother's emotional unavailability at times, and the fact that their father was often away due to business, the children became extremely close to Elizabeth. Catherine Sedgwick wrote of her, One should have known this remarkable woman. The native majesty of her deportment, Mumbet was the only person who could tranquilize our mother when her mind was disordered, the only one of her friends whom she liked to have about her, and why? She treated her with the same respect she did when she was sane. As far as possible, she obeyed her commands and humored her caprices. In short, her superior instincts hit upon the mode of treatment that science has since adopted. When Pamela was away during some hospitalizations, Elizabeth was in charge of running the home and family affairs. During Shay's Rebellion, in short, an episode of the history of Western Massachusetts, when an uprising of farmers and other men who felt they'd been wronged took up arms against the government and those they thought had duped them, in an attempt to change policy, a band of Shay's men forced their way into the Sedgwick home. Because of his public position as a leader of the community, they believed that Mr. Sedgwick may have had a hand in the cause of their distress. But Mr. Sedgwick wasn't home, so Elizabeth had to deal with the invaders. She quickly took the family's silver and hid it all in her own things, then went back to the kitchen and grabbed the ash shovel. As the men searched the house, they would repeatedly demand that she tell them where the valuables were, but again and again she refused to give in. All the while, she shamed them for what they were doing, pointed out all the good that the members of the household had done for others just like them. When the looters came close to discovering where she'd hidden the silver, she then belittled them for daring to search the items of a servant woman. These were not bad men at all. They were just everyday citizens who were looking to take from the rich and possibly corrupt to fund an uprising for the bettering of the lives of the poor and overtaxed of the area. She was not the enemy. 
she wasn't doing them any harm, so the men couldn't bring themselves to disturb her anymore, and left. They did, however, take the Sedgwick's horse, and a few other things. In 1808, only a few years later, the lady of the house had died, but the children were all grown and moved on to their own lives. Elizabeth had saved her earnings and could afford to buy a house of her very own in the same town. She and her daughter made a cozy home of it, but Elizabeth was by no means out of work. People still visited her frequently for her midwife and nursing skills, which were well-renowned. Her daughter would marry, and she lived there happily with frequent visits from her sister and grandchildren, including the Cedric children, until in 1829, December 28th, dear Elizabeth passed away surrounded by her family. She was just as much a member of the Sedgwick family in death as she was in life. In fact, she was buried in the Stockbridge Cemetery in the Sedgwick family plot, which has been given the nickname the Sedgwick Pie due to its layout, which is that the graves are set in larger and larger rings around the middle. Elizabeth was buried in the center of the ring, right beside Pamela and Theodore. Her stone is still there and reads in well-worn script, Elizabeth Freeman known by the name of Mum Bet, died December 28, 1829. Her supposed age was 85 years. She was born a slave and remained a slave for nearly 30 years. She could neither read nor write, yet in her own sphere she had no superior or equal. She neither wasted time nor property. She never violated a trust nor failed to perform a duty. In every situation of domestic trial, she was the most efficient helper and the tenderest friend. Good mother, farewell. Her will was signed with an X, and shows what she cherished most of her things. A gown from her mother, and a silk black gown from her father, were items she never parted with, and which she desired would still be cared for by her descendants. One of those descendants could be W. E. B. Du Bois, who claimed that she had married his great-great-grandfather, though that would mean that Elizabeth married a man twenty years younger than she. It could well have been the case that her daughter, Little Bet, later called Betsy, with whom she shared a very similar name, was the one that in fact married his great-great-grandfather. It's more probable that Du Bois was descended from a child from his great-great-grandfather's first marriage to a different woman, then second to Betsy, so Betsy may have been a step-great-great-grandmother. Either way, he'd still be a descendant, even if only by marriage. W.E.B. Du Bois grew up in Great Barrington to be a great champion for the liberation of blacks in the South and for the cause of equality. It surprises me how unrecognized Elizabeth Freeman is in our national history. She is known in the Berkshires far more than she is anywhere else. In an episode in 2012 of the PBS show Finding Your Roots, featuring Kevin Bacon and Kira Sedgwick, did present the topic to a national audience, and I hope introduced a few more people to Elizabeth Freeman's significance. Yet, other than her gravestone, there are no monuments to her. There is no statue or painting hung in a place of state pride, no timeless gesture for this woman who changed the course of history for a nation. There is a small surviving portrait. In the image, she's wearing a necklace of gold beads. She later had the beads made into a bracelet, and upon the clasp had etched the word Mumbet, before giving it to Catherine Sedgwick. The Massachusetts Historical Society has it now. The house that Theodore Sedgwick built is still there in Stockbridge, and is still a private home in the family's hands. The Ashley House in Sheffield is now a museum, and restored to its original state. It keeps her memory alive with weekend tours and reenactments of life there at the time. This is a beautiful house, and was the site for quite a few other great events in history, and a place anyone interested in history should see. Mumbet once said, Any time while I was a slave, if one minute's freedom had been offered to me, and I had been told I must die at the end of that minute, I would have taken it, just to stand one minute on God's earth of free woman. I would. This has been The Berkshires Gone By, created, written, directed, and read by myself, Brooke Renier, and co-produced by Deanna Garner. If you'd like to contact us, find more episodes, or see images relating to our topics, please visit our Facebook page. You can also email us at theberkshiresgoneby, all one word, 
at gmail.com. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. Thanks for listening.